So I can hardly tell you how much money I have spent purchasing all kinds of great plants, but especially wonderful native plants. But now I'm finding out from my friend Joanna here that I probably have all kinds of great plants in my yard. So we're gonna find some of them. So tell me about some of the plants that are sort of anchoring your now native yard. Okay, I'd say the two biggest anchors, biggest in terms of volume, are the violet that lawn people love to hate. This is just common blue violet, Viola sororia, and I just kept it where it was. I stopped mowing, it got fluffier and fluffier, and it kept spreading. And the second big plant that I'm using are the native sedges. So everything that looks like grass here and all over, it's kind of going up and spilling over. They're native sedges. I have at least four different species. I'm not sure what they are, but I know they're in the Carex genus and they're part of this native habitat. So once I started ripping out the turf grass and the mondo grass and the liriope, this is what's left behind. So that's like, that's like the background for everything else. So what is this gorgeous fern? These two are Christmas ferns, which is my favorite fern. It's an evergreen. So it's green all year and it sends up fresh little fiddleheads in the spring. And I've got some marginal wood fern over there popping up. And then these kind of clumpy things are coral bells. And they haven't come up yet with their blooms. Uh, stuff that's blooming right now really is just the astilbe. There's one, two, three. The columbines have finished. There's a false blue indigo over there, which is a wonderful plant in our cedar glades. It's just tremendous. The cat mint is not native, but you'll see there are native bees all over it. The, our native bumblebees start coming out around May 1, and so that's who's on it right now, and you can see the little pollen baskets. So I, I do it for them. And then the shrubs that are blooming that I plugged in are Virginia sweet spire, and every one of them came from a little sucker that was in someone else's yard. So they rooted right away and came up nicely. And that's really, that's the mark where that was the only bed until COVID. Everything else was lawn that I mowed. I try to keep the mowing just to four times a year, but I mowed it. So all this stuff has been since then. Okay, so I love this tall plant here. I just think it looks like, you know, something wild and crazy. But what is it exactly? It is wild and crazy. And for years and years, it would come up in the lawn, just these strange, long, toothy leaves. But I would keep mowing it, it never got any higher. But as soon as I stopped mowing, it became that. And it'll get eight feet tall if I let it. It's a giant ironweed. It doesn't belong in a shade garden, but birds, I guess, or the air, air gave it to me, so it stays. But I will chop it down so that it'll bloom lower. Otherwise, it really will be just too high to even enjoy. But so many pollinators come to that plant. So if it's at eye level, I can see who's coming. Right. Oh, fantastic, because I know that is a plant a lot of people are after. Now, you also have, let's see, I'm assuming you're keeping this for a reason, but uh, help me figure out what it is. Okay, this is a, a, a geum. It is white avens so there's a spring avens that comes up in the woods that's yellow and it's it's like a little low thing but this gets quite high and it has white flowers kind of like a strawberry bloom but smaller and it gets this tall this is also the white avens and i i made this so that people could see what it looks like after it germinates in the yard it's just all over the yard so i dig them up grow them in pots and when they get big enough i plug them in where i want and eventually I wanna have a whole ground cover bed of just white avens. Um, baby blue eyes, yeah. But, wow, how did you come across this? This is underneath, I guarantee, it's underneath the turf grass and in shady corners of every lawn in the neighborhood. You just have to get on your hands and knees and be weeding by hand like an idiot to find it. But isn't it cute? And the flowers, oh my gosh, this is a flower. That's, it's called small flower baby blue eyes, and that is a small flower. Now that is just precious, and I imagine this has wildlife value. 
Yep, as a native plant, it does, and it loves shady, moist nooks. It's related to another baby blue eyes out west, which really is blue. I think this is more white. Your yard has a purpose that's bigger than you. The signs let people know that this is on purpose. It's a certified wildlife habitat yard with the National Wildlife Federation. And more recently, it's a certified Tennessee smart yard. Okay, this all looks like stuff I've been pulling off of walls and out of bed, so save me some more time of weeding. Let's start with this one here. Well, honestly, all these vines are good plants, but they are in the wrong place, so I'm going to pull them up later after you leave. <laughs> but it's good to meet our neighbors, and these are all neighbors we all have. This one in your hand mm -hmm. is it comes up like tough wires and it twines around things and it drives gardeners crazy. Um, there's a young leaf and then they can be variable, you know, how many lobes they have. It's called Carolina snail seed. Um, it's going to have tiny little blooms the pollinators will come to and those blooms will turn into fruit that looks like candy from like a machine. And inside the fruit, is a seed that looks exactly like a snail. So it's Carolina snail seed. All right, super fun. Yeah. Okay, okay, so I'm leaving that one now. Okay, um, this one with all the spines, I feel like I probably have scars from this one, but tell me about it. This is, oh yeah, we know we have this when we're weeding and, and it hurts. So this is a native greenbrier, it's a Smilax. And you'll see that the fresh new emerging leaves are kind of bronzy. That's a telltale sign. And the fresh ones are so tender that they're almost edible because they are edible. People eat these. They, uh, you can eat these raw, the very new fresh tips, but people cut them up and cook them kind of like poke salad, but without having to boil them three times. So they're not toxic. Okay, that's great to know. Now, I see one that looks familiar, but I don't know if it's just because I've weeded it out or for or I've bought it. I don't know. So this one here, these very distinctive lobes. Yes, and I see that coming up in trash alleys. I'm very, very, very happy about it because it is the host plant, the plant that the Gulf fritillary butterfly aims for when it's time to lay eggs. So she'll fly around and land on plant after plant after plant and taste with her feet until her feet tell her she's on a passion vine. Then she can lay an egg. And luckily, I don't know many people who grow this as a garden plant, but it is a wild plant. And it climbs by these tendrils. It'll climb up anything. And as you can see, this might not be the best thing for a garden bed. I would have it in a barrel or in a part of the yard where you mow around it and then it can just do what it wants and feed so many butterfly caterpillars. So this is the yellow passion vine, Passiflora lutea. Tiny little blooms with the same crazy shape as the more common purple passion vine, which is the Tennessee State Wildflower, with those big old tropical looking blooms with the Christological symbolism and all that stuff, it's so cool. And I have that in the back, but I plucked one stem just so we could Look at the leaf in comparison to the yellow guy. So they both have the three lobes. These are bigger. These stay this like spring green. You tell me about this. Um, what is it and how can I identify it in my yard? This is a weed that I find in lawns, front yards, backyards, next to the sidewalk, and people yank it up because it looks like kind of a hedge bind weed with those long heart-shaped flowers. And uh, one time I was weeding it and I noticed that my hands smelled like peanut butter, which happens to be a field mark for this milkweed vine. This is a milkweed. This is an actual host for the monarch butterfly. And so it's a really good thing that I find it in trash alleys because she finds it there too. She will land on it, lay her eggs, and I find caterpillars growing on chain link fences that no one knows about. So milkweed vine. Now there are several milkweed vines that grow wild in Middle Tennessee. This is angle pod because look at the seed pods, angle pod. Isn't that cool? Oh. It's got these ridges, and each one of those things is a seed. Um, here's one that was in the front yard. I dug it up for you because you can see how velvety the stem is. That's, that was my first clue, and then the peanut butter smell. So I'm gonna plant this on a trellis and see what happens. Now this, 
I know I've ripped out lots of this, but I'm now starting to keep it because I like the little flowers. Tell me all about it. This is fleabane, so it's the Erigeron genus, and it's an amazing plant that seems to thrive on neglect. I see it in lawns everywhere, and it makes me so happy when I see people who have mown around these islands of fleabane, because they're, they're keeping it until it flowers and seeds so that next year there'll be more fleabane. Most of them are annuals, some are biennials, so you need to let them go to seed so you'll have more the next year, and usually, it's just a pollinator magnet, like the little tiny guys, the hoverflies and the all kinds of little creatures are just zooming around. There are crab spiders eating those. So if you, like on a sunny day, you can pull a chair beside it and it's an amazing sit spot because there's all this drama going on around you just because of one weed that you didn't weed. This is one of my first and favorite wildflowers. Tell us all about it. This is American pokeweed, and it feeds so many creatures. Uh, there'll be little caterpillars eating holes in the leaves. The cardinals come and eat the little caterpillars. And when it gets taller, it's gonna have lots of little white blooms, which feed pollinators, including hummingbirds. It's always a surprise to see hummingbirds on little tiny flowers. Then those flowers will turn into the pokeberries, that beautiful, pinky purple color that people use as ink and dye and paint. This looks like a problem we've all run into, which is a bush suddenly turns into a home for vines. You get in there and try to pull it out and I don't know, Joanna, that's that's looking like uh, leaves of three. Leaves of three and it's glossy and kind of red. But the surprise is if you keep going down the vine, they get more leaflets until you see all five. And that's a good native vine. Virginia creeper. I love this and I want to know where you got it because I want some. This is an endemic sedum in our cedar glades. So if you go to a middle Tennessee cedar glade where there's like bare limestone, this is like growing up out of it everywhere and it's called widow's cross. Um, it's a stone crop, it's a sedum and it's an annual. So once these little pink slightly fragrant flowers bloom, they'll set seed and they'll germinate in the fall. Over winter is like little weird red things and then do this in May. And they're exquisite. There's just carpets of them in the cedar glades. Well, you can't take anything from a cedar glade. They're protected natural areas. But I had permission to take one little spoonful and this is what happened from one spoonful last year. Well, Joanna, my eyes are so open now. I can't wait to sort of crawl through my yard and see what I can find. So thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. It's my pleasure. For inspiring garden tours, growing tips, and garden projects, visit our website at volunteergardener.org or on YouTube at the Volunteer Gardener channel and like us on Facebook.